episode of Cigars and Sea Stories, Bennett and Mike sit down to discuss gear. Gear that's worn on the body, different generations, the like. I mean, everything from poncho liner boots, deuce gear, Kevlar gloves, eyewear, sling, field jacket, poncho, grunt rolls, butt pack, all sorts of different stuff that we're talking about today. I love doing these different episodes because the sea stories that we go down, but also there is a serious difference in between what was worn when... Bennett was hooking a jab at in recon, and then back in, in the nineties, back in the nanny, back in the day, when I was shitting in diapers. Not really, not really. Well, no. maybe. I don't. Probably. I don't. Know. I was like, out. Of, I was potty trained by then. Fuck off. So then, <laughs> so then the army days and what you guys wore over there in Hooaville, and uh, in Hua with the big Huaj and a little Huaj, and then how that translates over to the modern times and even how much it changed in between when I was in the fleet and the two different times that I was in the fleet. So first up, the greatest piece of gear ever known to man. We could probably just frame an entire episode around this, the poncho liner, the whoopee, yeah, the whoopee. You get f- Do you call them ranger panties and not silkies also? No, I call them silkies. That's good. They, I, yeah, I always called them silkies. And the one I got in the army, <clears throat> I didn't call them silkies, but I was a Marine in the Army, so. Right? God, that's yeah. weird. So. It is weird. The poncho liner, I quickly, I, I mean, in boot camp, I realized that was the best piece of gear known to man. Um, that and the, the smoking jacket was the second, close second. The field jacket liner. That yeah. was a close second. I am. I, I, but you know what, though? Here's the thing. Same material. Mm-hmm. Same concept, same material. Yeah. Well, and I didn't get a field. They made underwear out of that material. No. I'd probably wear it. Oh, yeah, I totally would. I thought you said that they did because then I was going to scour the internet for it. Like, yeah. if you had an elastic waistband and maybe, like, just make little shants out of them, you know, maybe just elastic around little right above shanties. the knee. You know, you're going to look like you're wearing bloomers, like a giant diaper. Um, but man, your balls would be so warm. Oh my god! Ugh. sitting out on post. That right there, I would make that for hunting. You oh know? yeah! Hell, oh hell yeah! That'd be nice. So, the poncho liner, yeah, it's like a safety blanket of sorts. I think it's just. I mean, it's warm. It's versatile. You can use it as a pillow. I use it as a pillow the majority of the time. If we had the sleeping system, I just shoved it up in the hood. Right. Or, oh, man. Because we didn't, I, I, well, did you ever have a shelter half? I mean, I did, but I never used it. Not, no. Right. Hell no. So I never, I never used the shelter half. And stupid boot camp, I think they had us do it once. And I think they had us set it up at like MCT. We didn't even use it in the SOI or anything. Yeah. Well, MCT, I don't even know. Did you even go to MCT? Did they have that shit or did they roll it into something else? Well, when you go to SOI, you had two houses. MCT was Marine Corps combat training and then you had Right. And then you had infantry training battalion. Which, where which we went. everybody went to MCT, right? Everybody everybody goes to SOI and then the first phase so when you go to SOI, they split you. And if you're to use a, a term, if you're a pogue then you go over to MCT and everybody. So infantry training battalion first phase of infantry training is very similar to MCT, but they know that you're going to fill in maybe some of the blanks that they left off later on in training. Oh, okay. Gotcha. All right. Yeah. Yeah. See, we went, when we did MCT, it was just, yeah, it wasn't, it, it's, I guess it was similar, but it wasn't the same, but anyway, no, let's not go down that rabbit hole. Well, and it's right. So, <laughs> One of the things with the poncho liner, so I had, I had never done a shelter half, ever. We took ponchos, we took two e-tools at either end, and we hung a poncho in between them, and then staked them on the corner where the drawstrings were. That was right. essentially what we did for a shelter half, 
And then we had bivy sacks on ISO mats with however many bags, I don't know, going through boot camp. That was like the closest thing that I had to a shelter half. And that was the one right. time that I slept in row in bivouac side by side under like some sort of tent device the, the in boot camp. And then any other time after that, we slept under the stars. But um, I loved, oh man, if it was cold outside, I would take my poncho liner and shove it into my fleece. And then fold the arms around to the front so you had the entire back of your fleece with this big ass poncho liner inside of it all poofy. And you shove yeah, that. I, oh, I did that God. in the arm. That was just. And the other thing, too, is if it was balls cold and I was still all tucked up in there, I would take the fleece and I would pull that over my head. So, like, my shoulders and everything else are up inside of this poncho liner with the fleece and I'm all snuggled in there. Oh, <laughs> so speaking. So speaking of that, the one thing that I do remember, uh, once we started going down the, the field jacket liner, uh, because it's the same material. When I was in the Marine Corps, we got issued field jacket liner pants. Really? So those do exist. Oh yeah. I, I bet if you type We're them in. I bet if you look it up on Google, I bet they have. We're going to need to go to the listeners on this one. We're going to need. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I know that they had them. I know that th that we were issued them. Well, you know what? Yep. Here they are. Boom. Mm. Field jacket liner pants. Grab that. Grab that I pick time now. We're going to have to. We're going to have to post that on the show. No, that's fantastic. Field jacket. Military field yeah. pants liner cold weather trousers quilted olive drab green genuine army issue so oh yeah baby. so real quick on the poncho liner before we jump down to the field jacket here because i know where we're going the poncho liner at least what i was issued never had a hole in it like in the, the middle poncho of liner it. yeah no never so which i was always confused well, like because the poncho actually has Right, a, a hood, right? Right. Well, it's so because it's not made to wear together. Right, and so the old issue ones had a slit with stitching on the inside, like half inch right. loop back stitching, so that you could poke yeah. your head through there and then wear it as a poncho under your poncho liner. Right. But when we got the field jackets, we kept calling it the poncho liner, took away the hole, used the field jacket, which then morphed into the Gore Tex. So now we're still using what we call a poncho liner, even right. though it doesn't actually align your poncho, which when you use your poncho, it's typically like hanging on the side of your rack. Well, or like a lean to sure, out in the field. The poncho, uh, we like when in recon, we used it um, <clears throat> because we didn't have shelter apps. We didn't have any of the other stuff. So we would take that and actually put the poncho and poncho it, during the winter months, we would take the poncho and poncho liner together, tie them together as they're supposed to be used, mm -hmm. and roll it up in a like a ranger roll, tuck it into our the top of our pack. So then, whenever we sat down, you know, this is when we still patrolled in the woods. Yeah, uh, you know, um, which hasn't happened for quite a while. Not in the same, not in the same way. You know what I mean? Right. The nineties, the nineties were a lot different than, than after, you know, nine 11, um, at least training wise and everything else, I'm sure. So, but when we would get into like a little Harbor site or whatever, we're actually able to sleep. We just pull that out. We wouldn't even take our pack off. We would just sit down, stay in our pack because if we had to fucking run, we could still run with all our shit. Right. And you would just reach back, pull out your roll, throw it over you, and you're good. Yep. All strapped in. Right. <laughs> and everyone has done this in some form or fashion for oh, the God, most yeah. part. Oh, you yeah. know, range, re range roll, whatever the hell you want to call it. I mean, even when I was in the Marines, we called it a ranger roll. Uh, so I don't know why, but probably because they developed it or some gay thing like that or whatever. But the Rangers, uh, the Rangers in their role, freaking, 
you know, got us through some freaking good, hard yeah. Carolina cold, you know, because it does get freaking cold there. Uh, it's like especially, damp. Yeah, you're damp. So you literally, it would, you know, it'd like get down to 30s in, at night. And all you have is the poncho liner and the poncho over you. Uh, and you were just freezing, right? Yeah. But only if you moved. Right. <laughs> right? We've all been there. So you just sit as perfectly still as you can and you don't move and you're fine. <laughs> but as soon as you move, like your cami so I can yeah. brush against you and all that shit. So anyway. <laughs> oh my god. Okay, so we were sleeping <clears throat> we were sleeping like this in Bridgeport, right? Just as you would describe. We didn't have the ranger roll. We were just kind of like catching Z's, punch out perimeter. It was right. warm enough, we were fine. <laughs> You, if you're not used to it, it's easy to to try to slide yourself into a comfortable esque, comfortable style position, whatever. And usually somebody will crumple their legs up. One of these guys who remained nameless. We, we didn't get ambushed. It was like something on the perimeter took place, and we just needed to move, right? Like somebody was coming down the path, and so we just needed to move. It's that simple. This guy could not get up. His <laughs> his legs were asleep. They were not going to work. And we're like kicking them, rubbing his legs, just trying to get circulation back into him. He's like, and you know, it's one of those things where you've got two or three guys that are next to him. One guy is trying the entire time to lift him by his pack. Like, come on, man, we got to go. You know, and then two other guys like, shut the fuck, just shut the fuck up. Shut up. You're going to fucking hear us. Like, shut up. So, you know, you're, you have this scuffle of gear that's kind of moving around and you're trying to lift this asshole. And meanwhile, he's like, I can't move my fucking legs, man. I can't even fucking move. They're just dead. Like the entire time you're just trying to stay quiet. So that way these guys don't jump up on you. And then finally they're, you know, they're like shaking the life and he gets all wobbly. He looks like a, like a runner whose body is giving out at the end of a marathon, trying to run across, you know, fucking mountains. Like, you're out in the mountains, you've got, I mean, probably 60 to 80 pounds that are on your back. Oh, my God. Sight to behold. That dude face planted it, like, two or three times as we went Didi Mao and off into the bush. And he just kind of laid there. <laughs> the best part about it was he laid there on his weapon, <laughs> like, in a ditch. He's like, somebody roll me over. And it's like, why? What is wrong with you? Your legs have to be fine by now. By now. He's like, the needles. The needles. <laughs> yep. Oh my god. You only do it once. You know what I'm talking about. I, I do. Done, I've done that I shit do. before. I know exactly what you're talking about. And you think about it too. You're like, oh damn, I never really thought about that. Yeah. If a limb goes to sleep while you're asleep in your cot, and then you get called out on QRF, I mean, you just how long does it take a limb to get conscious essentially? And you're trying to run out to the truck and like. I've done that. I've ran out to the truck with a dead limb before. We are like, get back to like you're trying yeah, to man. throw your shit on with one arm. Like, what the hell is wrong with me? Yeah. One time we were running out to the hooch and Leo, one of the other guys, he was like, oh, my God, I think a ball's asleep. <laughs> Which happened. A ball. A but ball. That happens. You know how it is. Oh, my God. Oh, dude. Yep, yep, yep. Anyway. Awesome. Sleeping in the field, poncho liner, poncho, field jacket. See, now I only knew the Gore Tex, but I yeah, was. Yeah, see, I, I mean, I, I had a field jacket that I never wore. Uh, and then by the time I got to the Army, it was all. Uh, so 1998, it was all Gore Tex already. So, uh, at least in the Army, probably not in the Marines. But I had a field jacket liner. I'm trying to think, did we have Gore Tex? No. Pretty sure we didn't have Gore Tex, but maybe we did. Right at the end there, like 95, 96, maybe. Yeah. I don't remember, though. I I, I just don't. Well, I just cold. don't freaking remember. I just I just remember I was either wet or I was fucking cold the whole time I was in. Yeah. What, either wet. Sorry, there's three things. Wet, cold, or dodging fucking bugs. You know, just trying to, <laughs> like, like we would bathe and fucking uh permethrin oh god 
and and our BD, like you, you know, <clears throat> we'd actually take our camis outside and fucking hose them down with that shit. Yeah. Because we would sleep in the nastiest n- shit. Ugh. You know what I mean? And so we would be all up in Mosquitoville. Right. And if we didn't use it, shit. And chiggers, oh my God. Yeah. So we we were just always like, you know, and then we'd spend as much time in the water as we could after that because it relieved all that pain from bug bites and yeah, ugh, fuck, it's oh. horrible. But yeah. anyway, that's like so in DM school we were over there on Dam Neck and it's cool because it's a secretive annex. Anyway, cool range facility. We were doing stocks and I was out there and called for a walker. You know how in precision marksmanship, so in Desi marksmanship course and in scout sniper course, you do stocks and then you veg up, right? We didn't have ghillie suits or anything like right. that because you have to be a squad member on patrol and then you just walk off into the veg and you've got rubber bands and bungee cords and elastics and you can veg up. You've got a veil the whole nine yards, deliver a precision shot, hop back in with your squad and away you disappear. So the intent was you had like 30 minutes to do this stock, which was like quick in and out or no, maybe in an hour, quick in and out, whatever. So I'm all vegged up and I'm in and I call for a walker because I've got a firing solution and I look out on the front, like forward handguard and this spider, the size of my hand is crawling across the optic. It crawls up. You're doing your fucking dude. I'm telling you, arachnids love me. So they, this freaking weird looking spider crawls up onto the objective lens and is like blocking my vision downrange then crawls up over top of the optic and is like eye to eye with me as i look over top of the glass and the walker eyes eyes to eyes eyes to eyes there you go and the walker is standing there with a stick and i'm just like oh shit i got this damn spider on me and you know i don't say anything about it and so I'm looking through and the walker is next to me and this thing crawls up and I look back down onto the glass and put my eight point back down over top of the eye lens and it just crawled right up over top of me and then down my back and away it went and I took my first shot. So crazy. Yep. Dodging bugs in the swamp. And then afterwards when it was done, I was like, <laughs> Not so, yeah. what about load bearing gear? Oh, like, like your H harness and stuff. What did you guys? What was your fucking <laughs> rig, your rig? Sure, sure. Um, well, guy, you guys wore body armor. No, we had. So, did, did you guys have like we had all three one whole fucking kit that was all like you could like slide Ooh. into it like RoboCop or throw it over your head and bring it down. You know what I'm saying? That, Cause there's all kinds of different configurations. Yeah. So we had the age harness with gator clips over top of Vietnam era flax. Nice. In boot camp. And then we also had deuce gear. Uh, during the combat patrolling application, you got fleet Marine deuce gear that you had to get back. Jesus. Then, Right, then it was back to the H harness for the remainder of your combat training during boot camp, whatever, like second phase shit. So during range week, you got deuce gear. Any other time, you were back to the H harness and canteens and stuff. Then when you got to the fleet, it was new age deuce gear that was coyote over uh, interceptor plate or interceptor vests, which had a yoke around the neck and then a nut protector. And then eventually they said, you can drop your deuce gear and just attach your magazine pouches directly to your flak now. Or you can wear a leg panel. Uh, some of the dismounts got the chest rigs where you threw it over top and it was like one big cummerbund thing went across your belly. Um, like a chest rig? Yeah, well, yeah, it was a chest rig that had just shit tons of magazines and pouches and the whole thing. Yeah, yeah right. and it crisscrossed over your back. Uh, and then I left the fleet wearing interceptor vest. I had my own deuce gear that I wore when I was overseas on the second tour. And then when I was overseas on the third tour, it was 
in my opinion, the best setup, and that is you just had a plate carrier that you put on. Oh, I forgot. During the middle of the first tour, we got side tappies added. So those had Molly Loops on it also, and we attached our uh-huh, IFX uh-huh. to it. So in 2011, I had a plate carrier, no yoke, a nut protector, side sappies, and a cummerbund. Uh, and then I went out and got those pads. They're like these aero gel pads, whatever, from Aries Armory in uh, uh, mm-hmm. Oceanside. And I put those gotcha. put those under my shoulders because they're just seatbelt straps, essentially, that go over your shoulder. That's a shit ton of weight. Um, Special operating forces get the cry precision plate carrier, which has a like a vest inside of it that cinches around your frame. And then it holds the vest as a whole, like as the plate carrier as a whole. So, yeah, in my opinion, 11 in Afghanistan, we were wearing frog gear with plate carriers and then the like Mitch four or whatever. It was your guys old Mitch helmets is what we wound up getting. And that was the best setup, in my opinion, because it was limited. But we had Marines don't roll as limited as Rangers roll. They like have you seen Cry Precision's multicam? Uh, direct action setup no, that they got in the nope. cargo pocket. They have a loop inside of it for water bottles, mm. which is a ranger thing. That is a ranger thing. I'm not mocking it. It's just they roll around. They roll so light that they don't even bring a camelback. Meanwhile, right. I would have like a camelback, two water bottles in either cargo pocket because we're going out on long range reconnaissance patrols, essentially. I mean, we didn't, if we did a patrol and it was under six hours, then it was just kind of like a, oh, we're going to go recon this area and maybe talk to some people. It's not, God, a real, wish, it's, it's not a real patrol. But when I was in the Corps, I wish we had Camelbacks. Oh, yeah. Oh, Jesus, dude. It was all, you know, and we always, you'd even carry your two core canteen. Remember that piece of shit? Mm-hmm. So we'd have... Yep. Our regular canteens with whatever. Well, the one thing that was nice about being out at the beach at that time, though, was that they let us, we didn't have to be all uniform. So we could wear basically whatever fuck we wanted, as long as we had mission essential gear. Uh, like we didn't have to have, I didn't have military issue uh, load bearing or H harness and and mag pouches and stuff. I think I had uh, my, no, the majority, like my butt pack, my my belt, my H harness, my rifle mags, uh, pouches, my canteen pouches, all of them were all, I bought them all. Um, I mean, I had all the military stuff, but that was like, we just kept it in the foot locker in case yeah. of inspection or whatever. Because more than likely we'd end up having to buy new gear anyway, because as much time as we spent in the salt water, yeah, I would tear that shit up. So we just ended up going and buying better gear. Right. And we used to all buy our shit from this place, London Bridge, uh, in Virginia Beach. Oh London yeah. Bridge Tac- it's called London Bridge Tactical. And at that time it was a small, it was a small place. Now I think it's, they, yeah, they do like, they've, yeah, they've expanded quite a bit, but they would saltwater cure all their web gear. Beautiful. So, um, yeah, man. So that's where we used to, a bunch of us, not all of us, but a lot of us would buy stuff from there or other places. Yeah. Well, that, and- that were usually owned by either guys who had been in recon, were in recon, that were seals or had been, you know what I mean? Guys from the amphibious community. And, uh, that's what we would do. I mean, I know back then my, and I still have it because it cost me almost 300 bucks. My whole freaking and back. That was in nine. That was in 1993 when I ended up buying it. Yeah. <laughs> that was like a $300. And back then, who knows the same gear would probably cost six now. Yeah. Um, and, uh, 
Yeah, man. So that's what that's what we. But we didn't. We had flag fests, and the only time we ever wore them is if we were going to blow shit up. Yeah. And that's the same. That's the that's the only time we ever wore helmets either. It was when we were doing like demolitions training stuff like that. Or, uh, uh, I mean, shit. Never, never, never wore flag vests. Never wore. We didn't even wear, we didn't wear body armor. We didn't wear helmets or anything unless we were going to blow shit up. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. we just rolled with camis, H harness, mm-hmm. and boonie cover. That was it, man. See, it's and, it. and a shit ton of ammo and a shit ton of batteries. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Every, everybody had batteries and everybody had ammo spread load across their shit. And that's why everybody's pack weighed, you know, well, and, I th- and, food, and food stripped down MREs. Right. You know? <laughs> right. That are all taped together. Right. Uh, because we didn't want to carry any extra weight. And even with that, you know, I mean, everyone knows what it's like. But, uh, you know, even then carrying an 80 to 120 pound ruck, RTO was always fucked. Oh, God. Yeah. Ah, that's bad because because back then all of our radios were huge dude they were gigantic mm-hmm. Fucking huge and they still probably are uh but holy fuck man i mean oh i felt so bad for them and and a lot of times until we started carrying like satcom stuff on a regular basis which was just really coming into play you know yeah um, and <laughs> carrying prick, prick, fucking one Oh fours and playing dick dance games with the antennas. And Oh my God, it was fucking shit show. <laughs> and, but I always, so we'd have to also carry a lot of times you'd carry the, I think it was the prick one thirteen, which is the U UHF radio mm-hmm. with donkey dick antenna on it. Yeah. The sat antenna. Oh my God. God, dude, that I just felt and and corresponding crypto gear for both. Yeah. So I always felt bad for that guy. Yep. That was that was my guy. That was my buddy, Scott Mady, uh, <laughs> who now. Oh, man, just funny. He would always carry that shit. He was a short little fucker, but he was stout. Yeah. You know? But he yeah. uh, holy fuck, man. He'd have to carry a lot of that shit unbelievable see it makes sense to me why you guys would go out and purchase all your gear because i remember those remember the od green with i think it was like wool or cotton or whatever the material that was on the inside it was all cloth it was yeah that- we never we never had those oh but, it was like ancient yeah, shit no, i remember that shit i remember that we never had that we never even got issued that we had the nylon interior too yeah uh, but there were times like there were guys that would go out and buy the regular stuff like that and they would cut all the padding out yeah and just roll with the actual canvas uh yeah. no padding um because it wouldn't pinch you or anything yeah it's fucking weird but anyway see that's like it one of the things that we battled all the time was you have sand and grit and just shit that's going to be all up in your gear anyhow. Yeah. And because we were on that weird phase where we had the interceptor vest, which was the flap over, and then you you couldn't uniformly put... I mean, you could put four magazine pouches across the front of the thing, you know, and go running down range, but a chest rig or something that had like a universal just front Molly loop system on it to keep everything convenient right there was exactly what we needed. And so when we shifted over, I just think plate carrier is pretty much the best thing, you know, that you could ever have as far as body armor in the latest iteration, you know, yeah, plates and stuff like that right now they're heavy. They won't always be the armor factor will eventually like spread out to where you have a lighter, thinner material, which will go throughout the body. But for what we have right now and what's available on the market, the plate carrier in its current configuration, however that may be, is just kind of like the best of what we have. And it was always, how do we keep stuff dust free, 
Molly or uh, dummy corded to us and accessible at the same time, which I can only imagine how difficult that must have been in an amphibious setting mm. to where you're waterproof and shit for your Alice pack. And oh, dude, it was horrible. And everything that you needed for like weapons and ammunition for when you hit the beach, because I didn't do well, any of that. One of the so. worst things is imagine, imagine doing all that shit, right? And getting ready prepping for mission and whatnot inserting and swimming in but you're you're waterproofing like failing Ugh. and then you're fighting to keep afloat with a sinking pack or al you know what i mean right because it did happen it happened to people from time to time where either the waterproof bag and then also because we would also double triple bag the freaking stuff yeah so you would do it you would you would waterproof everything in you know those white trash bags and then you would uh, or black trash bags and then you would put everything in a waterproof bag as well yeah and we would test all this stuff but still inherently like you know we had a buddy i remember we did a helo a helo cast and one time and we weren't that far offshore but um yeah man i don't know if uh Something ended up piercing a buddy of mine's all his gear. Every piece of waterproofing that he did and his whole fucking pack just flooded. Oh. Now, luckily, he didn't have any, like, extra gear and shit. But I just remember, like, us having to swim, like, three of us holding on to this one guy's pack. And oh. it was just full of water. But otherwise, it would have drowned him. It would have taken him under, you know? Right. Um. And we had all that shit dummy corded to us. So, you know, what the fuck? You're so, any, so fucked. Yeah. So anyway, um, you know, so you so, just hope that shit doesn't fail. So when you when you had weapons, so we're not talking about weapons on this one, but I wanted to talk about slings. What did you guys use for slings? We just had regular old this was before like they had come up with like single points and, and you know, the cool ass double point slings and right. all that shit. I mean, I get, we had, we had double, we had single points, but they weren't for, you know, we carried either a car 15 if you were lucky or an, or an A2 or a saw or, a, or a 60 echo. Yeah. So we just had the old military, the shit that they issued us. The green web sling. And half the time, what we would do is we wouldn't even use that. We would just make a, a sling out of a uh, 550 cord. Oh, and, nice. and a lot of time, and that was just kind of like at night. So you could like lash it to yourself. Yeah. Otherwise, we didn't even carry a sling. You just kind of rolled without a sling. You had your weapon in your hands all the time anyway wasn't we we never were slinging weapons you know what i mean sure yeah uh, and it wasn't like you know the you know hands free type stuff it right. was yeah so we we just kind of yeah we didn't really run with slings too much except for these the 60 yeah <clears throat> and the saw i think the saw gunner usually but sometimes he'd wear it sometimes he wouldn't yeah um Dude, that's interesting because well when I when I carried the 60 I had that fat sling and I would just like have it up and fucking ready right you know the big shoulder two point the, yeah the big fatty pad yeah yeah right right see so we had <clears throat> we had the green I just know it as a loop sling it's your basic like web sling as a J buckle and an M hook and stuff like that so that you can don your loop sling you know, um, we were always issued that. And then I didn't carry a sling overseas on the first tour, even though we had three points, but it was just kind of like getting in the way. Um, second tour I had, I clipped it. Like I had a 550 cord one point that I just clipped onto my shoulder. Like I had a carabiner. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, single point. Yeah. And then I, carried Which I really like those two. I had, I had that. No, oh, it's funny as I had that when we deployed to Egypt in the army. Yeah. Uh, but but yeah, we never wore our gear. And yeah. That, you know, unless we were on guard, we never. You know, so I had it on guard. But yeah. uh, 
I never wore it like when we were going from point A to point B because they didn't want us all geared up because then we presented a threatening posture to the right. locals. Well, so and- we just, <laughs> yeah, it was a shit show. But- <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, the and Ox- in Bosnia, Bosnia, we had just the regular, I guess it was a three point. You know that so we could sling it in front of us sling it behind us yeah um this is a regular m4 you know regular issued sling for an m4 the three right. i guess like it's 2.3 point whatever the fuck they all right you yeah. ready you ready to be jealous <clears throat> sure all right so on the plate carrier i had a carabiner in the small of my back mm-hmm. and i took my one point which you normally put over one shoulder or the other, wear it like a sash, and then you clip it right where your buffer tube meets up just behind your pistol pistol grip on the AR. Mm-hmm. So I had a Troy swivel mount that was in there, and I took the one point, carabined it to the small of my back, went up and over both shoulders so that the one point would hang in the middle of my kit. And then on the Troy, it could swivel, and you could go to either arm, just very easily. You know what I mean? You didn't have to, it wasn't cumbersome at all. When you went to transition, like, you know how it is. You draw a pistol, you tilt inboard with the ejection port cover coming inboard. So all the working components are near you. That way, when you take a prone, it doesn't fuck up your gun and you transition over to the pistol and carried a safari. That was one of the other things that we don't have on here is I carried a safari land holster that had no retention device that went around the tang, around the pistol grip, nothing. It had a thumb. It was like a clip, if you want to call it that, but it's basically like a plastic arm that goes down to the front. So as you push your pistol into it, it clicks around the pistol, and that little thumb depression is on the inside. So you come to a full draw, right? You come to a full draw set, like down on your pistol grip, Flick that little arm and pull up and out of the holster and you're good. It's like, it is by far the quickest holster I've ever had on my hip. And you know, it's a drop holster. It's a combat style holster. Um, Oh my God. That right there was the fastest setup I've ever ran down range with. And that's what I shoot with right now. You know, that one point and then I don't have that drop holster. I don't, know, you know. <laughs> I don't like drop holsters. Well, I mean, for Ever, everyday yeah. use, they don't make any sense. But for running now, around, now I guess if you're playing tactical, <laughs> playing on, airsoft or some shit, you're playing airsoft, you're like tactical games on a range or whatever. I, I don't know. I I just always found uh, leg rig as annoying. It it cut my mobility. It you know because it always if because if anything came loose, it'd be flopping around on your fucking leg if you're running, especially. Yeah, uh, it, it drove me fucking nuts. So I I ended up just going with a straight pistol either, um, and on my on the rig that I have now, I have one rig that I wear that I've got it on my belt, yeah. just like a, like a cop would wear it. Yeah, and I'm actually I, I'm more adept at drawing that way too from that right. Point. Um, and then the other way is on another rig I've got. I actually have a pistol on a chest rig. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Where it's like a cross draw kind of not not like a you know I mean it's just sitting there. Yeah. But it's right on my chest. Yeah. Which is really convenient too. But I prefer the the belt up high yeah. on my on my waist. So if, uh, <laughs> you, you... well, it's because because when I carry concealed, that's how I carry as well. Sure. So when I keep it consistent. If I'm able to, you know. If I'm going to battle, whenever the fuck that is or would be or whatever, I'd have it in the same place because why wouldn't it? It's consistency. Right. Um, that it, It's, you know, muscle memory and all that other shit because if I were to change it around, it'd be like a bumbling idiot. So I keep my back up, right. my chest, and I've got the, you know. See, that's, I wore the drop, I wore the drop holster around the fob. Right. And then I took the lanyard and attached it to my belt. Wait, was it the belt? No, it was my gear. I attached it to my gear. And then I put the pistol. There's like a... It's like a little pouch that's behind where your cummerbund is. 
Yeah, yeah. It's like you can just stuff little knickknack shit right. down in there. Stuff in there. Right. So I would carry my map in there, and then I stuff my pistol in there. And LT came out and got butt hurt one day, just so butt hurt. He's like, "That's not in a holster. What are you doing?" Blah blah blah. Now keep in mind, this lieutenant was, I mean, like. <laughs> he was one of my fucking shooters for Christ's sake. This guy does not have a, he doesn't have a fucking light to stand on in this argument. He's a boot, right? And it had bed down range like once carrying a pistol. So I'm like, okay, no problem. I'll put it in our holster. So I went back and I got one of the coyote tan holsters that were left over from the PAT team prior to us. I trimmed everything off of it. So it was a black U shaped loop. And I stuffed it inside of that little pussy pouch in the front of my thing. And that was my oh, holster. God. And then I <laughs> shoved it down inside. There you go, sir. It's all holstered up. Enjoy your air conditioning. See you never. Bye. And then wound up going down range. Yeah. And I had it because I keep it. It's not on a cross draw. It's almost like an appendix carry so that it's on the right side of the gear so that when I transition you know, I reach, I would come off the pistol grip straight up high center to the right, grab the pistol, and then now I'm presenting the pistol, but my arm is cocked at a 90 degree with the elbow tight against my ribs. Right. When that happens, you rotate your left wrist or your non-dominant side so that the ejection port is inboard and then bring your long gun up under your armpit and present forward with your dominant hand with the pistol. So it just made for smooth transition coming right off the body like that. Couldn't agree with you more. The other thing with a drop holster is it's hard to get to when you're in the prone. So if you're battling the way that we yeah. typically do, yes. tree line to tree line, and in and around different pieces of cover, your legs are nice and tight together, just like Superman. Mm -hmm. And then you're down low and in cover. And if anybody comes up on you, you don't want to reach all the way down to your leg. You no, want to pull that fine. thing up, press, 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 press. I'll fire a pistol that's inches away from my face. I do it all the time. I practice out back like that. You yeah. know where you're going to use your pistol, people, in modern society? Because they don't give it. I'm going to tell you right now. An assailant doesn't give a shit about your wallet. They give a shit about your car. And where they're going to come and get you is in your car. So you might want to practice sitting down and firing out the driver's side window and with a loud concussion going off inside of your vehicle. Because that's where people get shot. Or they want their car, they'll steal it. So I mean, it's the same. It's the same basic thing. If you're talking about your kit and you pull from right there, I had an instructor one time who was like, "Oh, you don't want to discharge that close." I'm like, "What are you talking about?" So long I'm as I'm gonna the, discharge for wherever the fuck it's safe. Right. I, exactly. Like the muzzle is not anywhere close to my face. I'm totally fine. Like you could put a gun right next to my hey, head. I'd rather have a. I'd rather have injury from a muzzle next to my head for my gun right then from some guy pointing the gun at my head right well it leads so. and it leads to another item on our list also like i was one of those guys who always wore eye pro and and gloves i always wore flight gloves that was my jam yeah no max i i always had them too that that's what i wore my entire 10 yeah. years in military army and marine corps i wore nothing other except for when it was really fucking cold, but I still wore Nomex under <laughs> the, right. the, the cold weather gloves as well. Uh, our trigger finger mittens. Yep. So I would still wear um, Nomex under that. So I had, I had OD green Nomex and I had black Nomex. I had both. Nice. Um, it just depended. And, and it, it wasn't like mission specific or anything. It just, when I, when my finally wore the trigger finger out and my green nomad, yeah. <laughs> um, which happens. from the, from the core, uh, which I actually stitched up, I stitched up that hole many a time, uh, and the thumb from the selector lever. Yep. Uh, so I, I would stitch those up and then it just got to a point where you couldn't do it anymore. So I still have the gloves though. Oh, yeah. Um, and then. I they didn't have any OD green ones available, and I had to have them because we were deploying to uh, uh, some fucking where, right. and I had to have them like ASAP. So I went to the to the uh, I even went so I went to the PX on Lejeune, and they didn't have um, all they had were black. 
they didn't have any um any od green ones or the sage green sorry yeah because that's i think technically the color that they use for those yeah i went out to like somewhere out in town and they didn't have them then i was like well i had the bright idea i'm like well what the fuck you know a- these are aviators gloves so i drove the cherry point and yeah. uh they didn't have them there either all they had were the black ones so i ended up buying black ones there yeah so whatever See, I, and then and then i had those part way through my military career through, through my army career even and then i the last two years that i was in the army uh i got another pair of greens nice. so yeah i went through three pairs in 10 years hell yes um and they were wow all fucked up oh god Half yeah. the time. it's just because i they they once they get that salt on them you're not getting rid of those things you right. know you wear them until they literally rot off your body right and, oh hell yeah uh, and so well I, I have three ratty ass pairs of freaking gloves because after two years they'd be fucked oh god, like, most yeah. people would go and buy new ones but mine were all stitched up and I think I had like a patch on the back side of the of the one on my left hand. It was fucking funny. Right? It's a shit show. I still so I had OD green and then I had tan. And uh Chuck Norris signed one of those tan nice. flight gloves. Oh, that's fucking funny. Hell yeah, man. <coughs> that was nice. epic. Yep. Tell me a Chuck Norris joke. Chuck Norris's dick has a hemi. And they're like, what? You can't, we can't. And Chuck Norris is laughing. He's like, you mean like Dodge? I'm like, yeah, like your dick has a Hemi. Like that thing's got a Hemi. You know what I mean? <laughs> he thought it was funny. It's got a Hemi. And so, uh, yeah, it got a good laugh. And then the Whois who were filming and were like, yeah, you can't say that one. We got to go a little bit more we PG rated. We can't, right, we can't put that in the, uh, right. in the freaking USO documentary that we're doing. Right, exactly. So it's like. <laughs> So it's like, okay, uh, commercial that we're filming right now for AFN. Uh, we can't say yeah. that his, on... his, his penis does not have a Mopar Hem- engine in it inside of it. No, right. we can't. Right. So I did the whole boat water gets <laughs> Chuck Norris joke and yeah, but dude, it was epic because when we were leaving, we were down by the clearing barrels. And it was one of those hodgepodge teams where we were all just kind of like, they ran in into the hooches and we're like, who wants to go see Chuck Norris? So anybody who went out of the cat team just kind of comprised one section of vehicles and then went over to Blue Diamond. So I, during this weird, like offhanded patrol, I was in the gun the one time that I was in the gun. And I had a Maud Deuce. I understood what I was doing with it. I had checked headspace and timing prior to leaving and all of this other stuff. And Chuck Norris is walking down. So, um, LT was down in the truck, Lieutenant Laracy, uh, what's up, Walt? And, uh, he was like, Hey man, tell Chuck Norris, he's a badass. And I was like, you're a badass Chuck Norris. And it was right as I had grabbed the charging handle on the Ma Deuce was like, shh, 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 full load gun up. And, you know, per SOP, we were about to leave the wire. Who the fuck cares? You're just going out to work. And Chuck Norris stops in his tracks and he's like, you are a badass. <laughs> that's just funny yeah like, you're not, completely not a badass not a badass kid. not at all you're just not some, a badass like just some goofy kid from michigan who knows how to work a machine gun but and and, and yell on videos on fucking facebook right do you like that range time <laughs> that, was Woo! Range time. that was funny as shit nobody wants a 20 minute video here's me uh-huh. goofing off in my backyard yeah we observed we observed all we observed all firearm safety rules we're good yeah yeah, so so did you kill a deer out of season? No. What do you mean? I'm just kidding. I tell you, the other picture that you freaking took was of Bambi tracks. And oh. Then, and then, and remember that? <laughs> yeah. So you took a picture of Bambi <laughs> Excuse me. You took a picture of some Bambi getting barbecued. Yeah. Yeah, I, sorry. I, uh... Is that the deer? <laughs> is that last year's deer? That was last year's deer. Yeah, I... I was out. Uh, well, well said, sir. Well said. Good cover. You like that? Yeah. No big whoop. <laughs> um, so I was out there with a suppressed twenty two. Um, we actually feed the deer corn right off the back porch. Uh, <laughs> no. By, just, by hand. Totally, 
by hand. Right. I'm totally. I and then he just guts it. He kills it with K-Bar. Kill it with a nail gun. Okay. Right. It comes up so close. <laughs> All right. We're going to, we're skinning this thing. You're going to have DEC at your freaking <laughs> back door tomorrow. <laughs> oh, shit. Yep. It's going to be freaking envir- North Carolina Department of Environmental Conservation. It's going to be sitting out, parked parked outside Fob Invictus. <laughs> like, so uh, we heard some shit. All right. They won't find any about wounded you, animals. I'll tell you that you much. Kill, about you killing deer out of season. <laughs> no big one. No, Sorry. No, you know, you know what I was doing? So any hunter understands this. You got to go and hunt, obviously, during all of the different seasons of the year to see where the deer are traveling, moving, eating, what their patterns yeah, of life of are. So I had I was walking around with Trey Caraway and Todd it's Fleetwood. Scouting. It's called scouting. Right. There you go. Exactly. So Todd and I, Todd, Trey, who are with Blue Four Tactical, look him up, Blue Four Tactical. He's a gun dealer in the area. They're doing, a, uh, excuse me, a range uh mma style training as well as self-defense and the whole nine yards we'll have them on again later on once they're up and humming but these guys were out shooting with me all day yesterday and we were walking around you know down in that area lots of scrapes lots of rubs lots of good stuff all out on my land stay the fuck off my land these are my deer so, <laughs> so it had rained earlier in the day yesterday and i knew if there were going to be any fresh signs that they would be out there and those tracks man that came right down by the watering hole that I've got off the back yeah, edge yeah. of the property. Do yeah. they are those tracks are easily two inches deep. And we're not talking yes. about like mud here. We're talking about packed sand that are two inches deep. I mean, this is a heavy deer moving through here, you know, with a with a pretty decent sized gate on it. Nice. At, at just a basic walkthrough. So yeah. So it's tracks like these. Well, you'll still be there for meals season like this year. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. And oh. Andrew McDowell. Andrew, quick shout out oh, to Andrew. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So Andrew does a lot of stuff for us on Cigars and Sea Stories. He listens to the episodes before they come out. He edits posts. He runs our newsletter. The guy is, like, awesome. Awesome dude. And, uh, yeah, I was fortunate enough to shoot that deer I mean, Andrew could have shot the deer just as equally as I could have. He just didn't have the same shooting pattern, like shooting path that I did. So I don't think he really had a line of sight or a, or a shooting solution. But we were together in the blind. He got half the deer. Um, he's going to be coming down here this fall for another hunt. And then I've got a couple other veterans who are in the area that will be coming out and hunting, which North Carolina has a lifetime hunting license and you just call in and they yeah. send your tags i mean it's mm-hmm. awesome it's unbelievably awesome so and i you know i buy by law and everything else but it's nice because <clears throat> the fo- oh yeah so you guys shot that deer and then tim and i yes that helped. was awesome dude tim and i drove the truck out loaded it in the back of tim's truck yep and then uh came back and uh you guys butchered him up and yeah well and did our thing and we're talking about gear here on this episode so i mean even when it comes to hunting you know the better you know how it is the right gear the right tools for the job that's it plain and simple so we had the stuff that was necessary in order to get the deer in the cooler but it wasn't necessarily the best tools for the job and now what i've got because i had it all set up when i was a kid anyhow you know every everybody up north who hunts has some sort of like kit and so not not oh yeah everybody's got like hunting gear yes gear that we go out in the woods with that's totally fine but i have a cooler that's got trash bag like a a fresh box of trash bags fresh box of ziplocs uh all of my butcher stuff is in there my skinning rigs in there uh that you know the hang rig everything else is in that cooler so that way, literally all we got to do is like, all right, I'm going to start skinning. You go get ice right now. And that's it. You know what I mean? Because I'm, dude, yeah. <laughs> I've been there elbow deep in blood, guts all over the place. And you're like, mm-hmm. honey, honey, you got like two feet, your thumb and forefinger on either side of the cell phone. And there's three or four bloody fingerprints on the front of the screen. And you're like, yeah, right. look, okay, to target, I need, 
Shit, I need bags. Uh, fuck, what else do we need? Ice. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, what are you doing? I don't know. I'm covered in blood. What? What is going on? What are you doing? Like, ah, I shot a deer. It's awesome. Oh, my God. Exciting. But you don't have any of the shit. Yeah, man. Which, I mean, very easily, it pertains exactly to what we're talking about on this episode. Because <laughs> in the middle of a firefight, it's easy to forget the assets that you actually have attached to your body. Yeah, man. Guys will go through a firefight and it's like, why didn't you launch a grenade? Well, I didn't know that I could. Well, you have a two or three and you see that these guys are maneuvering around. It's something that your squad leader could, or your fire team leader could probably direct. I mean, the fire team leader is going to have a two or three. You wouldn't give it to the ammo man. So it's like knowing the gear that you have and the resources that you have. And we were talking about going out and buying gear. I would, I would be willing because this just kind of wraps it up. I'm a gear queer. I don't know if you are. I am not. I'm a. I'm but I a, laugh at you because you are. I'm a gear queer who goes. I'm gonna get. Geardo. I'm gonna get this, and that is obsolete. You're a fucking geardo. Like, do you know what I mean? Well, I no, do. no, because it's the same thing that you do. You're a geardo. Because you took your issued stuff and you were like, "This is great, but the salt water is gonna fuck it up." So now I'm going to go out to London Bridge and get badass gear and then wear that out in plus the salt water. Way, plus it just looked way fucking cool. Yep, so there I you know. go. See, see, that's the true mark of a gear queer. <laughs> that's, oh, dude, take a selfie. I look so cute. It's like who wants to also like things like that, like who wants to wear. Uh, all right. So we would have these issued like booties that they would issue us with like wetsuits and stuff oh and they yeah it's fuck horrible like they look they at the end of the day they just looked gay as fuck <laughs> so a lot of us would wear israeli combat boots instead yep. plus they had a tread so you could kind of like do multiple stuff with them like if you come off the boat or out of the boat with you know your 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 dive booties on it was just gay <laughs> at least i thought it was you know what i mean yeah. it was just gay so if you had the israeli combat you could still put your fins on over them but then you they were multi-purpose they weren't like a a una purpose piece of gear which is the dumbest fucking gear ever if your gear only has one purpose other than your weapon which is to dis destroy fucking things right other than that your gear needs to have multi-purpose you know so anyway, yeah, yeah, there you go. I'm not changing shoes in the middle of a fucking right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Time out, guys. No, I didn't double knot let these. My, let me pull my fucking jungles. Out. <laughs> Hold on. No. Oh my no, god. Fuck. So I'm just saying. That's that's what would, that's what would happen. See, that's what it is. You're gear queer too. You got to have the right yeah. gear for the right job. It's all about the I'm, essentials. I'm trying to want me into your little bullshit club. Well, I'm just, I'm not the guy. I'm not like a garbage wagon clanking around the battlefield with, I, oh, yeah, I've I got like, that. I've Those got. Guys so fuck. See, that's what I'm talking about. Like, that's where gear <laughs> queer gets missed. Gear, gear queer, but we'd call them geardos as well. Right. He's got, <laughs> he's got three canteen cups. Who needs that? What are you doing? What or, are you doing? Wait. They literally have like 14 different thing molly clipped to the front of their right. shit. And then they're literally like clanking or light and noise discipline just doesn't fucking Oh, God. Happen. See, we got to have my buddy Chad on here. Oh. Chad is an amazing human being. Great dude. Motor T operator who wound up going over an MSG program came to us as a police advisor and was like, you and this other section later have been to war multiple times. I'm doing what you're doing. And you look at the guy and he sets up the kit the exact same as you. That's totally fine. It's whatever. It's a little flattering, truth be told. The guy just wants to, you know, be up to par. <laughs> and then right. he comes back from the PX. And it's like, oh, dude, I got I got a pack of like 40 S clips. Right. Uh, and I've so got, got to like S clip everything to everywhere. Right. And I've got and I've got like 400 yards of 550 core on a spool. That I'm uh, that I'm gonna put in my bucket. And pack. I'm tying everything down. Everything gets dummy corded. My dummy cords are dummy corded, and then I braid them. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Yep. Which he wasn't really that bad. But yeah. But he was that bad. 
Totally. But he was, he was <laughs> he's the guy who always smiled oh, <laughs> during God. the photos. Oh, God. <laughs> when you look at us and, oh, dude, we're in PB Goombody and we're all just like, uh, you know, dying, all of this other stuff. Chad, God bless him, was in Sangin for all of like a couple of weeks or in a, a Kajaki for a couple of weeks and then would bounce back and forth at a time. But he was in Lashkar God dealing with all of the logistics nightmare alone, a sergeant. Out in Lashkar God, like locked on, dealing with it, dealing with our gunny and everything else. I mean, it was a nightmare, dude. And so when we were in Sangin, he was like, yes, the real war. And meanwhile, all of us are like, oh, fuck. Damn it. Like, <laughs> I never thought I'd say this, but I kind of miss Kajaki, you know. And so we're all getting ready to leave. And we're just, I mean, I weighed 192 pounds. I mean, mm-hmm. sitting here right now, I'm like 210. And I weighed 192 pounds, like emaciated. And <laughs> Dude. fucking Chad, he's got his glasses and a big shit eating grin. He's kind of like strawberry blonde hair and the complexion that just fries when you walk out into the sun. God bless him. <laughs> yep. So that's who I think of when I think of like S clips. And don't worry, sure, I'm from the internet. <laughs> I it's bought different. them all on the internet. Coming from fucking Amazon right now. But he was a, but he was a locked on dude. He was yeah. locked on, had everything ready to rock. It's just when you look at it, you're like, oh shit. I, hey man, I've told Chad this face to face before. I'm like, every once in a while when I look at you, I just like I know that you're a marine and you're locked on and you're solid and stuff. You're just not the guy that I see on the commercials. Just no offense, buddy. <laughs> just no offense. Love you, but yeah. <laughs> and, and it's oh, dude. Yeah, and he he had well, and then of course you have the other guy who goes out and just buys brand new everything. Wants to wear the latest and greatest. Will buy dragon skin if he can. Will buy multi cam combat ranger shit whatever. And we're like, dude, I get it. Like I needed to go out and buy some extra pieces of gear. I went out and bought a wrist GPS from Garmin. That was a damn good buy. I got my own Camelback. That was a good idea. You know, shit like that. But, like, you don't need to go out and just rebuy an entire set of issue gear. We had guys who went out and bought plate carriers, for fuck's sake. You want to talk about a gear queer? My God. Going out and buying your own plate carrier. I was cool. Uh, yeah. I was cool walking around. And, I, I mean, my salt dog camis felt like I was wearing pajamas. And I had, Yeah, man. Pajama and, pants. Yeah. yeah. And I had broken combat boots. I Damn was man. so happy. With a limited plate carrier that just like protected my nuts and all my vital organs and stuff, I was happy. Oh. I didn't need dragon skin. No. <laughs> all right. Ah, uh, the differences. Gotta love it. Yeah, if you guys out there, we didn't even break in the middle. I mean, we just started rolling on this stuff. That's what if happens. You, I know, right? If you haven't already done so, subscribe, rate, review the podcast. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, and Player FM now. I would love to invite all of you on here to be on Cigars and Sea Stories. Like, sincerely, come and hang out with us. Like, reach out. Yeah. Send a fucking email or a message and say, listen, I'm a Marine. I've got an awesome story to tell. And come on and tell it. Yeah. Hey, open invitation. But yet, how is it that no one, well, I guess that's not true. There are, there, are, yeah. there, there are plenty of people that are like, yeah, man, I want to come on. I, I guess that's, I, I just want some random dude that I, I don't know, like a Marine from, you know, whatever that we just meet, you know, yeah. that either I don't approach, Mike doesn't approach, or that we don't know from like the past, like some random dude, man. See, I want, Be like, yeah, I want to come on the show. I want to get an, I want to get a World War II, like Ewo veteran on here. A Tet Offensive, like Kason veteran on here. You know, like I, I want to hear some. We're under fucking siege. Oh my god! Like, I want to hear a real like. There I was in the shit. Hell yes, I'm reaching out to Bing West. We like get freaking, him. we were like headed towards the beach in like a mic boat. Yeah, and ready to do God's work. I, everyone was puking and shitting all over themselves because they had dysentery and they were all seasick. Yeah. I want one of those fucking sea stories. And then we killed those fucking nips. 
Because of course they would say it like that. <laughs> Holy fuck. Oh, dude, we had a guy come up on the parade deck. Damn, dude. Oh, dude. They will too. Jim, look at it. It's some Ma Deuce. Do you know how many goddamn fish heads have mowed down with this motherfucker? Oh, you're still carrying this in a war? Yes, sir. The only thing we Shit, changed were the hand guards. Check this. That might be the same one. Let me check the fucking serial number. Yeah. Got oh, that shit yeah. tattooed on my ass. <laughs> <laughs> you know, seriously though. We need those guys. It goes down like that. We need those guys. Oh, uh, Deuce is fucking <laughs> serial number tattooed on my fucking ball. <laughs> gonna drag him across it in their face. I'm gonna kick, 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 kick. So where the fuck does that voice come from that we're using all of a sudden? I don't know. The old, the old crusty jarhead voice. There you I go. Guess that, that's, that's it. We got to get Master Gunnery <laughs> Sergeant Montgomery Fitzgerald on here. Yeah. Montgomery Fitzgerald. <laughs> Miss your Gunnery Sergeant. That's a character my buddy did in the fleet. I'll call him up. Do it. Oh, dude. I've yeah. Heard a lot about this guy, but never actually met him. I'm writing this down. <laughs> Montgomery Fitz, you're coming on. <laughs> Okay. There you go. All right, let's roll this. This is done. We're we're like this is a long freaking <laughs> gear. People get it, got it, love it. We've got generational differences, but I think it really comes down to the guy in the uniform. Not to sound cheesy, so it comes down to closing with and destroying the enemy. There you go. <laughs> and and what what we were doing it. Hell yes. There you are. There it is. And on that note. We cue the music. I will flag up front to every breeze From dawn to setting sun